health care reform is an important issue in America today. Unfortunately, many people are exposed to a limited perspective. I think you need to know about alternatives that work. Alternatives that are consistent with the American heritage of freedom. Hello, I'm Dr. Arthur Astorino, Chairman of Americans for Free Choice in Medicine. I'm going to take you now to one of our national town hall meetings on health care reform. This program features Dr. Leonard Peikoff. Dr. Peikoff is a noted philosopher, lecturer, and author of many books, including Ominous Parallels, The End of Freedom in America. Dr. Peikoff. Good morning. <clears throat> Most people who oppose socialized medicine do so on the grounds that it's moral and well-intentioned but impractical. In other words, it's a noble idea which just somehow does not work. I do not agree with that approach. Of course, socialized medicine or government control of health care, which is the same thing, is impractical. It does not work, but it is impractical because it is immoral. This is not a case of noble in theory, but of failure in practice. It's a case of vicious in theory, and therefore a disaster in practice. So I'm going to... <clears throat> I'm going to leave it to others today to concentrate on the practical problems which are legion in the, in the Clinton health plan. And I want to focus on the moral issue at stake. So long as people believe that this plan is noble, there is no way to fight it. You cannot stop a noble plan, not if it really is noble. The only way you can defeat it is to unmask it, to show that it's the very opposite of noble. And then at least we have a fighting chance. Now what is morality in this context? The American concept of it is officially stated in the Declaration of Independence, which upholds man's unalienable individual rights. The term rights, notice, is a moral. It's a moral, not just a political term. It tells us that a certain course of behavior is right, sanctioned, proper, a prerogative to be respected by others, not interfered with, and that anyone who violates a man's rights is wrong, morally wrong, unsanctioned, evil. Now, our only rights, our only rights, the American viewpoint continues, are the rights to life, liberty, private property, and the pursuit of happiness. That's it. According to the Founding Fathers, we are not born with the right to a trip to Disneyland, or a meal at McDonald's, or a kidney dialysis, nor with the 18th century equivalent of these things. We have certain specific rights, and only these. And why? All legitimate rights, if you notice, have one thing in common. They are rights to action rights to action, not to rewards from other people. The American rights, the original American rights, impose no obligations on other people, merely the negative obligation to leave you alone. The system guarantees you the chance to work for what you want, not to be given it without effort by somebody else. The right to life, for example, does not mean that your neighbors have to feed and clothe you. It means that you have the right to earn your food and clothes yourself, if necessary, by a very difficult struggle, and that no one can forcibly stop your struggle for these things or steal them from you once you have achieved them. In other words, you have the right to act and to keep the results of your action, the products you make, to keep them or trade them with others if you wish, but you have no right to the actions or products of others except on terms to which they voluntarily agree. To take one more example, the right to the pursuit of happiness is precisely that, the right to the pursuit, to a certain type of action on your part, not to any guarantee that other people will make you happy or even try to do so. Otherwise, there would be no liberty in the country. If your mere desire for something, anything, imposes a duty on other people to satisfy you, then they have no choice in their lives, no say in what they do. <clears throat> they have no liberty. They cannot pursue their happiness. Your so-called right to happiness at their expense 
means that they become rightless serfs. In other words, your slaves. Your right to anything, anything at all, at the expense of others, means that they thereby become rightless. And that is why the United States system defines rights as it does, as strictly the rights to action. This was the approach that made the United States the first free country in all world history. And soon afterwards, as a result, the greatest country in history, the richest and most powerful. It became the most powerful because its view of rights made it the most moral. It was the country of individualism and personal independence. Today, however, we are seeing the rise of principled immorality in this country. We are seeing a total abandonment by the intellectuals and the politicians of the moral principles on which the United States was founded. We are seeing the complete destruction of the concept of rights. The original American idea has been virtually wiped out, ignored as if it had never existed. The rule now is for politicians to ignore and violate men's actual rights while arguing about a whole list of rights never dreamed of in this country's founding documents. Rights which require no earning, no effort, no action at all on the part of the recipient. <clears throat> you are entitled to something the politicians say simply because it exists and you want or need it, period. You are entitled to be given it by the government. Where does the government get it from? What does the government have to do to private citizens? to their individual rights, to their real rights, in order to carry out the promise of showering free services on the people? The answers are obvious. The newfangled rights wipe out real rights and turn the people who actually create the goods and services involved into servants of the state. The Russians tried this exact system for many decades. Unfortunately, we have not learned from their experience. Yet the meaning of socialism, and that's the right name for government-controlled health care, the meaning of socialism is clearly evident in any field at all. You don't need to think of health care as a special case. It is just as apparent if the government were to proclaim a universal right to food or to a vacation or to a haircut. I mean a right in the new sense, not that you're free to earn these things by your own effort and trade, but that you have a moral claim to be given these things free of charge, with no action on your part, simply as handouts from a benevolent government. How would these alleged new rights be fulfilled? Take the simplest case. You're born with a moral right to hair care, let us say. <laughs> Provided by a loving government free of charge to all who want or need it. What would happen under such a moral theory? Now, I've been advised to cut my talk in half because they're running late. So I'll just synopsize. All right, this is what I had written originally. Haircuts are free like the air we breathe. So some people show up every day for an expensive new styling. The government pays out more and more. Barbers revel in the huge new incomes, and the profession starts to grow ravenously. Bald men start to come in droves for free hair implantations. A school of fancy specialized eyebrow pluckers develops. It's all free. The government pays. The dishonest barbers are having a field day, of course, but the point is so are the honest ones. They are working and spending like mad trying to give every customer his heart's desire, which is a millionaire's worth of special hair care and services. The government starts to scream, the budget is out of control, suddenly directives erupt. We must limit the number of barbers, we must limit the time spent on haircuts, we must limit the permissible type of hairstyles. Bureaucrats begin to split hairs about how many hairs a barber should be allowed to split. <coughs> A new computerized office of records filled with inspectors and red tape shoots up. Some barbers, it seems, are getting too rich still. They must be getting more than their fair share of the national hair. So barbers have to start applying for certificates of need in order to buy razors, while peer review boards are established to assess every stylist's work. 
both the honest, the dishonest, and the overly honest alike, to make sure that no one is too bad or too good or too busy or too unbusy. Now, in the end, there are lines of wretched customers waiting for their chance to be routinely scalped by bored, hog-tied hair cutters, some of whom remember dreamily the old days when somehow everything was so much better. Now, do you think the situation would be improved by having hair care cooperatives organized by the government, having them engage in managed competition, managed by the government, in order to buy haircut insurance from companies controlled by the government. <clears throat> now, if this is what would happen under government managed hair care, what else can possibly happen? It's already starting to happen under the idea of health care as a right. Health care in the modern world is a complex scientific technological service. How can anybody be born with a right to such a thing? <clears throat> Under the American system, you have a right to health care very simply if you can pay for it. In other words, if you can earn it by your own action and effort. But nobody has the right to the services of any professional individual or group simply because he wants them and desperately needs them. The very fact that he needs these services so desperately is the proof that he had better respect the freedom, the integrity, and the rights of the people who provide them. <laughs> A man has the right to work, but none of us have the right to rob others of the fruits of their work. We do not have the right to turn other people into sacrificial, rightless animals laboring to fulfill our needs. Now, some of you may ask here, but can people afford health care on their own? And even leaving aside the present government inflated medical prices, the answer is certainly people can afford it. Where do you think the money is coming from right now to pay for it all? Where does the government get its fabled unlimited money? Government is not a productive organization. It has no source of wealth other than confiscation of the citizens' wealth through taxation, deficit financing, or the like. <laughs> but you may say, isn't it the rich who are really paying the cost of medical care now? The rich, not the broad bulk of the people. It has been proved time and again that there are not enough rich anywhere to make a dent in the government's costs. It's the vast middle class in the United States that is the only source of the kind of money that national programs like government health care require. A simple example of this is the fact that the Clinton administration's new program rests squarely not on the backs of big business but of small businessmen who are struggling in, today, in today's economy merely to stay alive and in existence. Under any socialized program, it is the so-called little people who do most of the paying for it. And they do it under the senseless pretext that they, the people, can't afford it, so the government must take over. If the people of a country truly couldn't afford a certain service, for example, in Somalia they can't, Neither for that very reason could any government in that country afford it either. <clears throat> now, some people can't afford medical care in the United States, that's true. But they are necessarily a small minority in a free or even a semi-free country. If they were the majority, the country would be an utter bankrupt and could not even think of a national medical program. As to this small minority in a free country, they have only one recourse. They have to rely on private, voluntary charity. Yes, charity. <clears throat> in other words, the kindness of the doctors or the, of the better off. Charity, not right. In other words, not their right to the lives or work of others. And such charity, I may say, was always forthcoming in the past in America. The advocates of Medicaid and Medicare under LBJ did not claim, if you go back to the 60s, that the poor or the old got bad care. 
They claimed that it was an affront and an outrage for anyone to have to depend on charity. Now, the fact is, you do not abolish charity by calling it something else. If a person is getting health care, <coughs> if a person is getting health care for nothing simply because he is breathing, he is still getting charity, whether or not President Clinton calls it a right. To call it a right when the recipient did nothing to earn it is merely to compound the evil. It is still charity, although now extorted by the criminal tactic of force and hiding under a dishonest name. As with any good or service that is provided by some specific group of men, if you try to make its possession by everyone a right, you thereby enslave the providers of the service, wreck the service, and end up depriving the very consumers you're supposed to be helping. To call medical care a right will merely enslave the doctors and thus destroy the quality of medical care in this country, as socialized medicine has done around the world wherever it has been tried, including Canada, where I'm originally from. Can I take just a minute to clarify one point here? <coughs> about why and how socialized medicine enslaves the doctors? I want to quote from an article I wrote a few years ago called Medicine, the Death of a Profession. In medicine, above all, the mind must be left free. Medical treatment involves countless variables and options that must be taken into account weighed and summed up by the doctor's mind and subconscious. Your life depends on the private inner essence of the doctor's function. It depends on the input that enters his brain and on the processing such input receives from him. What is being thrust now into the equation? It is not only objective medical facts any longer. Today, in one form or another, and I was writing a few years ago, the following also has to enter that brain. <coughs> The DRG administrator, in other words, the hospital or the HMO man trying to control costs. This is what the doctor has to think. This guy is going to raise hell if I operate. But the malpractice attorney down the street will have a field day if I don't. And my rival down the street who heads the local PRO, the peer review board, favors a CAT scan in these cases. I can't afford to antagonize him. But the CON boys, the Certificate of Need boys, disagree and they won't authorize a CAT scanner for our hospital. And besides, the FDA prohibits the drug I should be prescribing, <coughs> even though it's widely used in Europe. And the IRS might not allow the patient a tax deduction for it anyhow. And I can't get a specialist's advice because the latest Medicare rules prohibit a consultation with this diagnosis. And maybe I shouldn't even take this patient, he's so sick. <coughs> After all, some doctors are manipulating their slate of patients. They accept only the healthiest ones. So their average costs are coming in lower than mine. And what's going to happen to my staff privileges? <coughs> Would you like your case to be treated this way by a doctor who takes into account your objective medical needs and the contradictory, unintelligible demands of some 90 different <clears throat> state and federal government agencies, which is what there are. If you were a doctor, could you comply with all of it? Could you plan or work around or deal with the unknowable? But how could you not? Those agencies are real and they are rapidly gaining total power over you and your mind and your patients. In this kind of nightmare world, if and when it takes hold, fully thought is helpless. No one can decide by rational means what to do. A doctor either obeys the loudest authority or he tries to sneak by unnoticed, bootlegging some good health care occasionally, or as so many of them are doing today, he simply gives up and quits the field. <coughs> the Clinton plan will finish off quality medicine in this country because it will finish off the medical profession. It will deliver the doctors bound hands and feet to the mercies of the bureaucracy. The only open, I'm, I'm at an end, for the doctors, for their patients, and for all of us, is for the doctors to assert a moral principle 
I mean to assert their own personal individual rights, their real rights in this issue. Their right to their own lives, liberty, property, and their pursuit of happiness. The Declaration of Independence applies to the medical profession, too. <clears throat> The, the battle against the Clinton plan, in my opinion, depends on the doctors speaking out against the plan, but not only on practical grounds. First of all, on moral grounds. The doctors must defend themselves and their own interest as a matter of solemn justice, upholding a moral principle, the first moral principle, self-preservation. If they can do it, all of us still have a chance. And I, I hope it's not too late. Thank you for listening.